I'm hiking the Pacific Crest Trail because uh, my family was uh, very avid hikers and we'd visit like Washington and uh, hike like parts of the PCT. So it was always kind of a dream of mine and like my sister's, but she couldn't be here. So um, this was my year to do it. <laughs> I really want to be able to use my body while I can. A lot of people that were close to me, they weren't able to. And so this is me trying to just get the most out of, you know, life while I can. And, you know, it's, it's really special to be able to just like walk somewhere and see all these incredible things every single day. I'm not here because I need to find myself or, or work through anything. I'm here because I love hiking and I want to connect with people and it's the right time in my life to do it. I needed to get rid of that mentality of like, oh, I always have to keep up. Like, don't be that weak link. You have to, you know, keep up with the boys, be fast, be strong, all that. And I need to let that go. I'm really appreciating very much the American backcountry. That means the nature as well as the people. And I just want to get to know it. And I think the best way to get to know a place is to just walk through it. I'm trying to do this hike waste free or as waste free as I can because I believe that leaving no trace goes beyond just not leaving your trash on the trail. It, it's about taking care of the trail itself and taking care of nature and the ecosystems that we're going through. Um, when I was back home, I was going through some, some mental health problems. Um, and I think that hiking the Pacific Crest Trail is gonna be able to give me some mental stability. Um, and I'm gonna be able just to learn a lot more from myself. Um, and so far it's, it's, it's definitely changed my view and my perspective on a lot of different things. Why did you hike the Pacific Crest Trail? concerns about the deadly coronavirus officially hitting the U.S. Here's what we know. A Washington state resident fell ill after returning from Wuhan, China. And anyone hoping to enter the U.S. from Wuhan must do so through one of those locations. This is an evolving situation. Literally every day we learn when a no bit more health about service it. in the world Beating could the possibly or it is, which means what possible. percentage of people exposed will actually get the increases overcrowded migrant camps. This is Last probably week, authorities confirmed the first case. In designing those steps, we of course have had to keep in mind that COVID is here to stay. It came out of nowhere and changed our lives. Everyone in their own way. I don't really think I need to go into all that. The streets and the shops emptied, and I, like many of you, 
was uncertain about everything. During the pandemic, I came across a book written by a Dutch man named Tim Voors, who had hiked the Pacific Crest Trail in 2016 and wrote extensively about his experience. The trail had been on my mind for many years, and after a few weekend hiking trips and with a newfound obligation to myself, I decided, all right, it's time to follow through on this dream. How did you know what gear to bring? To be totally honest, I didn't know very much about long distance hiking gear before I started planning for the trail. However, Hey y'all, Dixie here. I wanted to talk to you about the gear that I am carrying. Hey guys, it's Darwin here with my full and final gear list. Of Hi everyone, my name is Ariel. Welcome back to my channel. Thank you for coming back to my channel. I really do appreciate it. Hey YouTube. I'm Grant. What's up? Mountain Hardware PCT Pack. Titanium alcohol stove. Phantom 15 degrees. Z-Pax Arc Blast. Diddy Bag. Cork Ball. Sun Hoodie. Lone Peak 3. For socks, I have the Injinji My Toe Socks. My Z-Pax Duplex. I love these. <laughs> I love from Nemo equipment that I brought In this lineup, I have two pairs of Dyer Tops and one pair of Pops and Flutes. All right, the point is, is that there is a wealth of information from reputable hikers about how exactly they've hiked the trail and the best gear that they recommend you bring if you are planning a through hike. And as ultralight hiking technology progresses, it's getting easier than ever to commit to a through hike, uh, even for a novice hiker. Were you nervous? Committing to a six month through hike is a very nerve wracking thing. You know, it's one thing to quit your job and move out of your apartment, but to leave your entire life behind to something else entirely. I mean, it's literally pressing pause on your life. I was extremely nervous, but I also knew that I was on the right path. After packing up our apartment and putting everything in storage, it was time to leave. The day before my start was, I mean, honestly, I've never been more excited for anything in my entire life. Everything felt like it was in slow motion. And then the day came. And my first steps on the trail. To the ends of the earth, would you follow me? There's a world that was meant for us to see. To the ends of the earth, would you follow me? Lift your world. It's showing me his tongue. It's going like this. I was too, I was going, yeah. 
run extra miles. Yeah. Sorry. It's video. Some dirt on it. Yeah. yeah. Gotta get used to filming myself. Many hikers try to reach Lake Morena on their first day, which is 20 miles from the southern terminus. That wasn't in the cards for me, which meant I got to enjoy a milkshake my first morning on the trail. And then we were off into the desert. Are you taking what? I don't know, your fucking stupid camera won't work. Oh! That's the spot. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> On the trail, you can't just drink any water you like. It has to be filtered. Luckily, water filtration devices have gotten incredibly compact and durable. Yeah, I don't know if I've seen any titanium straws. Silicon straws are pretty cool because they're bendy. Oh, shit. Is that you, are you at? The body starts to change almost instantly on the trail. Acclimation to heat, dehydration, altitude, and the constant movement every day can be brutal. I started the trail alone, and while that was the intention, it wasn't long before I was forging friendships I hope will last me a lifetime. And and ladies and gentlemen, and others, uh, if the first this is all of the shit the that happens. I, I packed a whole box for Three. four days, and then there are Fantastic. two days that I am early to pick up my resupply. Water, so I have six days of food and only Three. need to have four days. And some of this is crap and is going to go in a hiker box for somebody else to enjoy, I guess. Very important espresso chocolate beans. Very, very vital piece of my diet. By the time I got to Mount Laguna, there was a huge group of hikers there. We spent the night at the local campsites and got to know one another for the first time. Now though, it was a busted back. Good eating. Good, David. Good, David. The next morning, of course, it was back on the trail. All right, you can see pops up there. I can see pops over there. Purple. Purple. 
called the Yellow Center. That's the thing about wildflowers. The thing about the desert is that naturally occurring water gets harder and harder to locate. There can be water carries of up to 30 miles at a time. And if you're going by the rule of five miles a liter, that's six liters of water. Each liter of water is two pounds. So you're carrying 12 extra pounds just of water. Ah, too good to pass up. Yeah. In these sections, without the aid of water caches and trail magic, the trail would be nearly impossible to hike. And where one finds trail magic, trail angels are not so far away. That's where my sign up list is. I've known them for five years now. Nice. Yeah, they're awesome people. This is my fifth season trailing. The town of Julian is 77 miles north of the southern terminus and is the first true resupply town along the trail. Mom's Pies, Julian Beer Co. And Two Foot Adventures, one of the best resupply gear shops on the trail. Age. I'm doing this out of pure passion. Mm. I, I, don't, I don't need to build a business so I have a foundation for my life. Uh, so I'm kind of a nomad. And other than homesteading in Alabama with, with a certain crew, this is what I love doing. So one, I enjoy the outdoors. I enjoy hiking. I enjoy taking care of people who haven't figured it out yet. That's why we fix a lot of problems. But um, I do it out of passion and love. I mean, th that's it. I'm not doing it for money. Uh, you can tell by our prices that I'm not jacking anybody. Hmm. And I could, yeah. but I don't. And um, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's, that's about the only thing I say. And the other thing I love about it is, you know, this passion part lasts about four months. So what does that mean? I got another eight months, I can go do what I want to do. Bright lights. Yeah. I did each individual item. Okay. I got everything squeaky clean. Hello. Hi. You might be filming. Yeah, cool. uh, just don't put it on anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, put it on anything. It'll be our own little film. Oh, no, just the five of us in the car. All right, that's fine. That's <laughs> awesome. No, I know. Yeah. Yeah, it's. Uh, Beautiful morning. Beautiful. Skip these miles too. If you want a Pringle, we'll take these. <laughs> go. I'll you want to go to Barrel Springs? This pack feels really heavy. <laughs> I want you to sum up this day in one word. Temperature hot. That's, yeah. not, one word. That's not one word. 
I don't care. It's two <laughs> words. And that's, what, that's what it's going to be. Okay. Fair enough. This day, one word. Gnarly. Gnarly. Mm-hmm. It's toasty. Toasty. <laughs> Toasty, toasty McRoasty. Toasty McRoasty. <laughs> if I get two words, it's Toasty McRoasty out here. You're feeling good. Yeah, I feeling think I good. got uh, three new blisters, new socks, but they're going to turn into one blister, which is a king blister, which is kind of nice. So it's generally I'm decreasing my numbers. Uh, this suck is real. <laughs> <laughs> Doing great. Yeah. Been like. I think it's like two or three hours we've been chilling here. Yeah, I don't think we got here even at noon. I think it's starting to cool down. Mm-hmm. Maybe. <laughs> Super <laughs> important, it's just very, very important. Anglais, s'il vous plaît? Uh, very, very important to, to <laughs> take a nap <laughs> and rest the beautiful toes. <laughs> Hi, gorgeous. How are you today? It's hot as shit here, but you're still looking fine. like 90 degrees. Every section has its challenges. The most difficult part for me was the desert and the heat. Yeah, clockwise. Is that? Yeah. Wait, this yep. <laughs> ah, interesting. Oh. Changing mm. Most hikers experience oh, blisters okay. within a couple of days. Two, okay, you're gonna poke yourself in the one, eye. Go. I heard it where you woke him. Oh. Uh. <laughs> There is something truly intoxicating about the isolation of a through hike. I'm filming you. Not long after mile 100 is Montezuma Valley Market. It's a new oasis in the desert for PCT hikers that's cropped up within the last couple of years. And after an unfortunate incident, they agreed to talk with me about what exactly happened to their store. Hi everybody, I am Kemi Pavlicek, the owner of Montezuma Valley Market. And I'm the co-owner actually with Mike, but he's not here right now, but he will be here soon. And this used to be our store. So we wanted to turn into like an agritourism, plant trees, bring a little more um, interest to the area. It's, It's beautiful here, right? You look around, it's peaceful. And so, we felt uh, we couldn't let it go because if this market was gone, it would. I think it would have been like just the end of this of this town. But you know, there are some times, you know, in the quiet moments where you try not to let the, I guess, the sadness. You know, you have like the different stages of grief like take over. So even though, when the store went up in flames, the first thing we, I would say, we kind of just thought was we were just gonna just just throw in the towel, right? Because it was just too much. But it was the locals who were just like beating down our door, calling us, texting us like, we can't let you guys go. We're not letting you guys go this way. It's not happening. We're not by ourselves. We're not doing this alone and it helps. The big thing for us was to get people to come in and gather. Uh, Cause here out in this rural part of San Diego, there is, there's a lot of loneliness and loneliness is, it's a terrible thing and it impacts your health. So even if you see this peacefulness out here, there are people who, who are just by themselves and they, it gives them, it gives them a reason to get up, right? It gives them a reason when they come in, they see other people, they have joy, they have smile, they share stories. Cause typical is not that much diversity here in this area, but 
whoever you are, wherever you came from, we made it a point where you were, everybody was welcome. And I didn't even think about this, but it was somebody posted a comment because, you know, everybody's grieving, the whole community's grieving. And she said that, you know, with all the craziness that's going on, every time she came here, she felt safe. That hit me. That hit me so bad because we fought for it, we worked hard for it, and it, and I didn't, you know, you kind of, when you're like working really hard, you kind of you don't realize just how much what you do impacts people. And this woman sounded so broken hearted. Hi, I'm Mike Palachek. I'm co-owner of Montezuma Valley Market. Uh, we lost our building this past uh, April and we're looking to rebuild and get the outdoor community to help support us. Um, we love you all and we hope to hear from you soon. We are trying hard. The community is fighting for us and we really appreciate all the love and support. Uh, we put a lot into this and you guys are giving you giving us your all and we appreciate it and we'll be fighting just as hard as well. They, they feel very like natural to like have on and then during the day. Chilling. Nice. <laughs> Next, it was on to Mount San Jacinto, the first big climb on the trail. My feet, my left foot in particular, were starting to hurt to the point where walking was very difficult. As I ambled up the mountain, I was starting to worry because the pain was just so bad. But my friends got me through it. <laughs> the dirt face. <laughs> the dirt face. <laughs> Idlewild is one of the coolest towns on the trail. And yes, the mayor is a dog and his name is Max. Hello, mayor. Hi, hello. You have permission to always tell me. Oh, perfect. I'm telling yeah, you, yeah. I'm, I'm telling uh -huh. you. After a night in town, my friends departed, but I decided to stay behind for a couple of nights because the pain in my foot was so bad. I could barely walk when I woke up in the morning. So I took some time off to rest.
What was your trail name? Well, every hiker on the PCT gets a trail name. You don't choose your own trail name, someone else chooses it for you. And it can be based on anything. Something you've done, something you've said, a story you tell, or maybe just an accident that happens to you. So your trail name could be Butt Scratcher, or Vegetarian, or Little Spoon. My trail name came from a night where I told my friends a story about my favorite film. Power to the people. Stick it to the man. And that very night, I was given my trail name, and Captain Fantastic was born. My foot was not improving. I'd wake up in the morning and no matter how much I stretched and rested, it was really beginning to feel like it might be broken. I told myself I'd get to Big Bear, have another rest day, and see what happens. Kenny's place is a home that Kenny, a trail angel, has turned into a hiker haven. Okay. And that's where I really started to get close to Lighthouse, Hopscotch, and State Farm. I left Big Bear with Lighthouse and Hopscotch, and we headed north together. Honestly, if it wasn't for Lighthouse and Hopscotch, I don't think I ever would have made it through the desert. But meeting them got me through it. What was the hardest part about the trail? The heat, um, and then also the injuries that I've sustained, um, physical injuries. I've had a lot of blisters, like 20 plus blisters. Um, I had a laceration on the back of my leg, which resulted in me having start antibiotics, which resulted in debilitating shits, like all day, every day in the heat, um, which was absolutely terrible. Um, and then tendonitis, a lot of overuse injuries, and then mentally that really wears down on you. Um, all the injuries and then not feeling like you're strong enough, tough enough, um, having enough fun, um, the heat, all of that just really wears you down. It's been kind of a challenge this last few weeks. Um, has definitely been the altitude. I'm from a place where there's only a thousand feet of altitude. Um, Toronto doesn't have very much at all. Um, and uh, it's just been a really challenging, uh, you know, uphill climb a lot of it so far. Personally, uh, the heat has been really difficult for me on trail and um, hiking with a partner has been a, a whole new level for, of challenge for us. Um, I get pretty angry in the heat and he gets hangry so um, we've had to kind of split up kind of in the middle of the day to avoid a confrontation. 
by day four I already had a knee injury and it was so bad that I couldn't walk and I was scared that I was gonna have to get off trail and I just took my time I relaxed and I started hiking really slow afterwards and I kind of learned how to deal with pain and manage pain without it letting stop me but without letting my ego get in the way so it was very humbling and now I'm always listening to my body and taking breaks when I need to and I think it's one of the biggest lessons I've learned so far. The climb from Cajon Pass to Wright Wood is a brutal 20 mile water carry, all uphill and under the heat of the desert sun at midday with no cloud cover. Why? The pain in my foot was just getting worse and worse, and I was starting to think, this is over. I'm gonna get as far as I can, but my hike is over. And while Lighthouse and Hopscotch summited Baden-Powell, I sat at the bottom, literally unable to walk. Shortly after Wrightwood, there is a fire closure where you can either walk the road or you can hitch around the closure. And we opted to skip the roadwalk and hitched to mile 400. Cheers. Oh, oh. Here's the 1.2 miles. Yeah! Yay! Yeah. Double zero. <laughs> Due to the pandemic, maintenance on the trail was lacking. As we inched closer to mile 500, I had a choice. Continue hiking on the foot, which at this point was swollen to twice its size, or skip ahead and rest and wait for my friends to catch up.
So I skipped ahead. I think more than anything, I was ashamed. Like here's this thing I've wanted to do for almost half my life and that I've held myself accountable to follow through on. And my body failed. But to this day, I remain so grateful to Susie and Matt for driving me over 100 miles north and giving me a chance. Susie drove me all the way to Kennedy Meadows South, which is at mile 700 on the trail. And when I got there, it's the loneliest I've felt in a long time, on or off trail. People I'd grown close to were far away, and I had no idea if resting my foot was even going to help. But hikers have a way of making you feel welcome, no matter who you are. And what was I going to do for eight days surrounded by new hikers rolling into town every night? Well... Mr. Booze, Mr. Booze, Mr. B-double-O-Z, that sure smells booze. I kept waiting and every day the foot started to feel a little bit better. After a week of rest, some familiar faces started to show up. A disembodied arm playing chess with itself. Kale and Fireball were set to head out the following day. My plan was to join them and see how well my foot had healed. I resupplied and picked up a bear can, which is legally required in the Sierras. Then settled in for one final night in Kennedy Meadows. Before we left Kennedy Meadows, I had a chance to sit down with a well-known trail angel and talk to him about his experiences on the trail. So my first through hike was in 2013. And the story of that one is in 2010, I shattered my tailbone. So I was sitting at a job site in San Diego and I wasn't able to walk for three or four months. At which point I decided to change my life. Went to a thing called Kickoff at the Lake Marino, which was an annual event back in 2010. And a friend of mine, Billy Goat, said, hey, you should walk the trail. And we all laughed because I wasn't walking very good. But that day we went with about 10 of us and I walked a half a mile from the monument in. And then when I got done, Billy Goat said, hey, if you can walk a mile a day, you can get there in 10 years. Two miles a day and my back was getting better. The next year I made it 200 miles in 20 days and realized I could make it to Canada. So in 2013, I walked from Mexico to Canada, it took 185 days. I didn't carry any weight. I walked about a mile an hour. Everybody passed by me, everybody went by me, but by being determined to just do this procedure of walking, and then I would sleep. So I'd walk four or five hours, sleep for a couple, walk four or five hours, sleep for two, walk four hours, sleep for two. So I was constantly on the move, hence the name legend. It kind of comes from a guy that never sleeps, but keeps walking. And so in 2013, I did make it. Uh, it was great, changed my life. Out here, you share your beliefs with people, but you don't force your beliefs on anybody. So we can have long conversation about shared beliefs, if you want to change your opinion, you can, but nobody's going to force you to change your opinion. The second one is in our community, we encourage others first. We encourage them to do the best they can every day to change their life. Uh, one of the other guidelines for changing it would be uh, let the community help you. 
if you have some issues that you're trying to work through, maybe sore body or sore feet or something, there's somebody here that's had that before and they can help you with your foot issues. If you have some loneliness issues about missing your mom and dad, there's somebody here that's probably not much different than your mom and dad that you can sit and talk to about how much you miss them. And there'll be an understanding. I think the last one is that we want to believe in the teaching and the learning. So every day we're gonna teach and learn in our community. If you quit teaching, you're really doing a disservice to the world. Teach somebody anything you know, whether it's as simple as making this video or what we're making today. And then learn from somebody. Learn the, learn the value of a conversation. Learn the value of, uh, today my value is taking 20, 30 minutes out of my life to make this video. And it teaches people that it's okay to sit down for just a minute. And I learned that it's okay to do this. Who inspires you? And it would be easy to say Billy Goat who hiked 13 times down the trail or Donna Softly who hiked, helps thousands of hikers. But the real answer is gonna be the same one that we're gonna to give to almost everybody. My trail name is Legend. So a legend inspires people to become the best they can. So without making the simple obvious answer, my parents, which is probably the answer for 99% of the people out here. It's their parents, their grandparents. You know, some of us have lost parents, so it's our grandparents. But it would be the person in your life that allowed you to grow up and be the person you are today. Now my parents are no longer really in, around, so I remember them. So I draw the inspiration from within. Every day I try to inspire myself to be better. I remember what I was like three days ago and how can I inspire to be better? So now the inspiration comes from self within, which is a self-belief that we teach on the trail here. I really appreciate this gentleman right here. Does a lot for the hiking community, right? But more importantly, it's therapy for everybody because it shows the act of kindness. I love you, man. Hey, I love you too, Pete. We'll see you down the trail. Yeah, man. Eight days of rest in the desert far behind. I was gonna give this a shot. I don't think I've ever been so grateful to walk in my life. Every day back on trail, I did everything I could to take care of my feet. <laughs> but, so, a very artistic picture of all of Hannah's shit. No, it's a video. Oh. As a precaution, I chose to skip Mount Whitney, the highest peak in the lower 48. Kaylin Fireball, however, went after it. This is not good.
Forrester Pass is the highest point on the actual trail. It's the first pass in the Sierra range, and as your lungs and body adapt to the high altitude, it can be brutal. But as it happened, I caught up with Hippie and Israeli, and we did it together. Every couple hundred feet, we'd stop to rest and look up at the wall of rock above. Yeah. Up at the top, we looked north. Incredible. In a sense, Forrester is the true gateway to the Sierras. Twenty-one was a severe drought year on the West Coast. Often at this elevation, the mountains are covered with snow throughout the year. All in all, we walked maybe 50 feet in the snow. Once you get into the Sierras, towns become more sparse and getting into town becomes a bit more difficult without a lucky hitch. Hike you to town! Hike you to town! And we're cute. And we're so, so cute. Take us in your car. Oh, I'm totally good. Oh, yeah. You guys have so much BLM land out here, though. This is the best place yeah, to do it. Yeah, we're very lucky. Yep. Israeli, Hippie, Scout, and I hitched into Bishop where we could resupply and load up on sugar. Israeli and Hippie decided to stay in Bishop because Israeli was having problems with his leg. But in Bishop, I was reunited with Kale and Fireball, fresh off of their ascent of Mount Whitney. <laughs> <laughs> Together, we headed back into the mountains. And by now, I was starting to feel really good. I'm taking a video of your shit face. It's really difficult to display the true majesty of the Sierras on camera.
that just shattered us. Ready to do that other eight. Few things feel better than finding your groove on a through hike. After the long days and the rest days, <laughs> and all the beautiful moments in between. Let's do a leg train. After a couple of weeks, we had made it to Tuolumne. This is a good idea. Thank you. Did you experience any crazy weather?
We were hit by some pretty gnarly thunderstorms just outside of Tuolumne Meadows. And so we camped under a boulder for the night. No, oh, wow, the light turned on. Look at that. Because it's so dark. Wow. Kale's foot had been bothering her for a while, and when we got up that morning, she decided that she was going to head back to Tuolumne and give it some rest. You're going to feel better in, like, two days. This was the end of our Sierra Trail family. It's a mystery to me. We have agreed with which we have agreed. You think you have to want more than you need until you have it all. Ah. Uh. Yeah, definitely worse. Definitely getting worse. Yeah. I hope you're not lonely. Wait, from just one? <laughs> Dude, Dave is gonna just show us all of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh! <laughs> oh! <laughs> In Tahoe, I said goodbye to Fireball, who had decided to go home. But I was lucky to have a few friends come up from the city to visit. The rest was really nice, and it was really great to see some familiar faces. But as I started to get dragged back into that sense of safety off trail, I knew I had to get back out. Without Kale and Fireball, this deep sense of loneliness started to set in. I was hiking on my own, sometimes going for days without seeing another person.
and I was just worn down. until, again, some familiar faces caught up with me. In case this doesn't go well. You ready? <laughs> Are you? <laughs> Whoa, good job. Yeah. Midwest! Yeah. Again. <laughs> so gross. We headed into Truckee to resupply and stayed at the local hostel. You guys rolling out where we rested up and even ran into our old friend Ginger Pony. I hit the trail with Lighthouse, Hopscotch, and Playlist. We'd been hearing news about the fires further north for some time. But coming up over the ridge and finally seeing the smoke on the horizon. By the time we reached Sierra City, the trail ahead was closed. And we were kind of stuck. Let's just wave. It's like in lifeguarding when there's like whistles. Hang on. Oh, it's going down. Okay. Yeah. It's right. going. Oh, oh, there's three. Oh. <laughs> Excuse me. What does that mean? Oh, okay, so we don't do anything. No, you're fine. Thank okay. God. Okay, thank you. Okay. For the north, the situation was... The Dixie Fire would rampage across Northern California for three and a half months. It burned close to one million acres, an area larger than the state of Rhode Island, destroyed 1,400 structures, and claimed the lives of at least three firefighters. Smoke from the burn at times covered much of the continental United States. We had no choice but to skip ahead. Lucky for us, an old friend from the trail lived nearby. State Farm and his friend Matt shuttled us around the fire. The fire's gonna move which way the, yeah, press this, the fire's gonna move the way the wind's going and go uphill. No matter how far north we drove, there was still smoke. But we decided to give it our best shot.
Our hitch across Northern California seemed to be paying off. We entered Trinity Alps and the views were amazing. The further north we went, the smoke from the Dixie Fire was less severe. See what we're looking at for the clothes. Oh, gross. That is gross. Oh, it's, that's gross. It's like brown water. The heat, however, was extreme. With our only relief coming from sporadic summer rainfall in the higher elevations. Alright, made it to the trail, heading into Syad Valley. We've heard Shyad, Syad, Siad. We're not cyanide. sure. Cyanide earlier. All over the place. We got everybody behind us. And I'm sure by the end of the day I'll be at the end. So we'll see how it goes. Seems our luck wasn't meant to hold. Just after Syed Valley, another fire sprung up just behind us. If there was one diamond in the rough, it's that we were about to say goodbye to California.
All right, ten seconds. Ten seconds. I have to hold a smile for ten seconds. <laughs> It'll start blinking faster, and then that's when you smile. There you go. <laughs> Yay! All right, before we move. Yeah, is it good? Yeah. Guys, <laughs> is everybody happy? I sent my friend this photo. It's an air quality reading of Oregon and Washington. And I said, I'm not, I'm not hiking in this shit. I'm done. A few friends in San Francisco let me crash with them while I figured things out. But many of my fellow hikers kept hiking. In the smoke and the raining ash. That's amazing. So beautiful. Gotta keep walking. Please don't be a bear. Or a mountain lion. I'm in like the three sisters obsidian part where you need a permit to camp, a special permit to camp. So I have to go two more miles. That's my pace, current pace. Some left the trail entirely and went and hiked the Oregon coast or the Colorado Trail. Oh, hello. A couple of weeks passed and the skies to the north were starting to clear. My time of rest was over. It was time to go back and finish. To be back with hikers, and to see familiar faces again, it's just the greatest thing. Here's to number three. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Ask any hiker what their favorite section of the PCT is. Odds are they'll say Washington. The beauty of the changing colors, the climate of the Pacific Northwest, even the consistent rise and fall of the Cascade Range, which often includes days of climbing four to 6,000 feet. It is the final stage on a long journey north. And I knew that I had to do it solo. As much as I could. What's that pouch around your neck? My grandfather always encouraged me to, to dream, to follow my heart, to use my imagination, to be creative. He always inspired me to do my best. In fact, when I graduated high school, we plan to do something special together, whether it was go on a cruise or a big road trip or a big hike. He was the first person who told me about the Pacific Crest Trail. The Pacific Crest Trail was not very well known. In the summer of 2008, my grandfather passed away from cancer. I mean, I, I, I loved him more than anyone. And for a long time, I struggled to come to terms with the nature of my new reality without him in my life. And it took a long time Losing someone that you love that much, that young, it leaves a mark. And it leaves a mark that doesn't go away. For a long time, I was afraid to move on because I thought moving on meant that I was finally accepting that he wasn't a part of my life anymore. All I have left of him are a couple of photos just random little snippets of our life together. So when I decided to do the trail, I knew that I couldn't do it without him. So I decided to bring him with me. So I carried his ashes with me. So he was with me the entire way. I started the trail hiking with my grandfather. because I wanted to feel connected to him. And from day one, I did. I felt him there with me. And I knew that we were gonna make it together. But if I've learned any lesson in life, it's that you have to call each thing in your life by its right name. And for me, he wasn't just my grandfather. He was the father that I needed in my life. 
So I hacked the PCT for both of us. Every step of the way, together. When I started the trail, that was the why. That was the only why. And that was my accountability for finishing. Was to bring him to the end. I'm excited to meet the person I'll become and I feel like now I'm, cha I'm changing very subtly along the trail like every day there's a subtle change that maybe I'm not perceiving but by the end maybe I'll get to see this new person and that's gonna be that's gonna be good. My dad wants me to go to college and I probably will but I'm gonna need to take some time for myself. I'm doing that already but I'm uh when I get off the trail, I'm probably gonna get my stuff together a little. I'm hoping to catch up with my dad. He started the trail three weeks ahead of me and I'm narrowing the gap. I think I'm at like 13 days now. Hi dad, you're the best. Thanks for always writing hi Lauren in the trail register. I'm out here, I'm hoping to uh, kind of figure out what I wanna do with life. I have a, a lot of time to think. So I kinda wanna go through and see what uh, I wanna do for a living. And then I have this goal for after trail. Um, I want to do a hundred mile ultra marathon. So I'm kind of using this as training. <laughs> uh, every step of the way I was thinking about, you know, things that had gone right, wrong in my life. My brother uh, committed suicide when I was younger. Uh, we'd gone broke as farmers, but by the time I got to the end of the trail, I, I realized that I would never go back into reality. And just like that, it was my last day on trail. There's a saying about the PCT, that it's the people you meet along the way. People on your journey who enhance every moment. The people who stand by your side on the mountaintop. Who get you to your next campsite. who share food with you when you run out. Who share the laughs and the pains. Who cry with you. Who live the magic that can't be conveyed on camera. The people who come from all walks of life with the same finish line. And the same dream in the back of their mind. It's the people who walk the same path as you. Who tread every mile under the same sky. We all walk the path, and by whatever means, 
we all seek the same end. The PCT, the hike, it's not just about one person's goal. It's about what we all carry with us. As each of our steps echo into those who came before and set a light for those who follow us. And then we turned that final corner. I had fantasized about what the end would look like for me. I was hoping for a quiet moment alone with my father. But that wasn't to be, and I reached the end of the trail surrounded by other hikers. If the trail taught me anything at all, it was to let go of my expectations and accept what is. And what is is that I got to say goodbye to him with a group of fantastic people. And we sent him off in spectacular fashion. Good John. Good John. Good John. My father once told me, no one else is going to write the happy ending to the story of your life. So go write one for yourself. If you want something in life, reach out and grab it. They say everything can be replaced. They say every distance is not me. So I remember every face of every man who put me here. I see my light come shining from the west down to So high above this wall, I see my light come shining from the west down to the east. Any day now, any day.
understands a man in this lonely ground A man who swears he's not to blame And all day long I hear him shouting so loud Just crying out that he was framed I see my life 